Paul. You've read Locke too many times. Right. Okay. Well, it, <laughs> it turns out that lots of famous liberals just sort of haven't. Yes, I know. It seems that they've I only that recently. <laughs> they've only they think liberalism started and ended with MLK's "I Have a Dream" speech. Yes, I learned that. Yeah. Which is ironic because he was also a communist. But but the point being, what I want to bring up here <laughs> is that Carl recently upset some prominent liberals on Twitter by suggesting that liberalism and communism are not inseparable, in a way intertwined, and that communism is executing on the unfulfilled promises of liberalism. Yes. Which is ironic because on the same morning and check the website very soon on, on premium content, we recorded a podcast, Why Wokeness is Liberalism. It is weird how that uh, converged. God has a fantastic sense of humor. I'm sure he does. So don't roll your <laughs> eyes. Lauren Chen nearly got you yesterday. Also go listen to Carl's chat about this with, with Lauren Chen that was aired yesterday. But I'm going to just preface this with the body of work that we've done on the website that you have done to set the stage for why you're an authority to talk about this. And Ralph particularly wanted to disentangle this topic. So very fortuitous. So you've done two articles on the five false assumptions of liberalism. Ten to, in total. Yeah, yeah and I, you have plenty more for uh, projects in the future, I, I am sure. But so do you want to give a quick summary of what the false assumptions are? Sure. Uh, liberalism evolved out of um, England, uh, mostly, in the 16th, well, uh, yeah, 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and this corresponds with the development of the concept of ideology. Because prior to that, this didn't really exist. Um, and when it's a very, very long subject, but essentially, um, the problem with the Enlightenment, I think, is the sovereignty of reason, uh, taking itself as the sole epistemological tool uh, of conception about the world. And so, as soon as you locate all um, valid knowledge in what is purely conceptually understandable, then you realize actually there's a there's a huge amount that you're taking away there, and this means that if you are going to co rationally construct a philosophy that begins on a set of premises, then follows through to a logical conclusion, uh, actually it's inevitable that you will have left behind a lot of information. Because uh, Locke, in fact, had a great turn of phrase for this. He says, all abstraction is subtraction. You are, you are seeing a thing, you're extracting something out of it, and then whatever you're leaving behind, you're subtracting out of it. And this is what Professor Michael Oakchok uh, described as the um, draining off of the moral, the liquid of the moral tradition to find the grit of the, the moral specifics. And so instead of being able to simply drink all of this down and get the good morals, the good governance, the good politics, uh, we've drained all that out and we're trying to choke down the grit of the ideological, rational assumptions. And okay, well, maybe that works if you are, say, the English speaking Americans who are essentially just having what you believe just parroted back at you. Uh, and so you're still in the moral fluid of your tradition. Um, but when you take that out and then you apply it to, say, France, that doesn't have the kind of English political tradition, well, you get the French Revolution, you get the Russian Revolution, you get all sorts of terrible things that happen because these things are um, based on something that is outside of your cultural experience. And moreover, if you start examining actually what the presuppositions of these liberal thinkers were, you realize they're nonsense. They're not true. These things didn't happen. And so this primarily, I would say, comes from the problem of the state of nature. A uh, man never lived as an isolated individual in the forest, and he didn't come together to form a civilization, and therefore everything that comes on from that. And so if you are to ideologically, outside of this cultural fluid, uh, take liberalism and apply it somewhere, it just fails. And we're seeing, we're living through the failure of it right now. Part of the problem of that is that an ideology is intended to export a political tradition from a particular time and place and think it's applicable elsewhere. For example, yeah. the Americans thinking that we can just export democracy to Iraq and we can just yeah. bomb it into being liberal. But as Joseph de Maistre, one of the critics of liberalism, quite contemporary at the time, observed, different governance styles are ergonomic to different peoples, different cultures, even different geographic landmasses. It's easier to think of yourself as an individual, frankly, if you're on an island like UK, rather than if you're a German with beset by all sides possible invading enemy states. So it just doesn't come as naturally to us. And so one of the things that we did uh, to execute on this series internally within, within Lotus Eaters is that we had a three-part debate series on liberalism with our colleagues Josh and Stelios, who are very well read. Josh knew a lot of the psychological literature on individualism, and he's a libertarian and decided to play a bit of devil's advocate as well. And Stelios thinks of himself as a very learned classical liberal because I he, mean, he was a lecturer at York University on philosophy. So exactly. He and knows so, what he's talking about. Absolutely. And so our critiques of Stelios's classical liberalism were that, frankly, not every liberal is as smart as you, as we'll see <clears> shortly. <throat> not everyone has read the theory. 
And unfortunately, there is this antagonistic dyad in liberalism because you value freedom and equality. They're not the sole values. There's also progress and universality, pitfalls of its own. <clears throat> but freedom and equality can often be in conflict. And so if the Marxists come along and say, well, you haven't achieved equality and that means people aren't free, then they can subvert liberalism from within, judo flip it and, and have some momentum to transition the liberals from the Marxists. And the liberals don't have much of a defense against that. Any thoughts on this so far? Oh, yeah, no, I, I love this debate. I think this is such a crucial, important debate, and it's exactly the kind of debates we should have because ideas have consequences, as the famous saying goes. So, understanding where ideas come from and where they differ and where they're actually very similar or potentially the same is an incredibly important uh, this discussion to have. And I was very much intrigued by, I think, a very quick tweet you made. I think, was it communism is liberalism or liberalism is communism? Well, no, I didn't, no, no, I'm not saying they're the same thing. Uh, I know, no, they're connected. <clears throat> Sorry. That, that, you, you, they're, you, they're you were much more precise. Is. Communism yeah. isn't separate from liberalism. Yes. <clears throat> and and kind of, I would like to, just for the, for the sake of, of, of provoking a little bit of a, of, a, of a debate, but I think it's an important one, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this. Um, if we even go beyond the 17th century, if we go back a little further, I think, of course, one of the, the connecting things between all these Western ideologies, I would argue, is... And I don't mean this as a criticism, but I think we have, in my opinion, at least, this is something we have at least to discuss, is that a common root that they share is Christianity. I think you see in yeah. many ways, right? The universalism of it, that the kind of the idea, that the very idea of the, you know, the oppressor-oppressed relationship. I think these are all things that grew out of, of a common, uh, sorry, of, of, of the Christian worldview. It kind of that it morphed then into something, even vocism, I think, has philosophically, not theologically, a lot in common with, with certain aspects yeah. of Christianity. As that. I consider myself a Christian, so this, this, I, I'm not speaking at this from an atheist viewpoint, but as a, that there are many of the things, and this is, I find, one of the things we also discussed early on. The, the true proof of culture, cultural values, is if you have internalized those values so much, you don't even recognize that you have internalized them. So, And this brings us back to the immigration debate. We have the sense that somebody who comes from a country that is different from ours, that is poorer, that have, you know, that, that, is, that, is, that is more authoritarian, we immediately see them as a victim, right? We immediately see them then through this Christian lens that this person is a victim, therefore, he resembles, not, not in, even, but even in the atheist mind, just not in different terms, it resembles kind of Jesus on the cross, right? This is somebody, I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean, right? Okay. Somebody... Who, who deserves our admiration. This is why then in the United States there's sometimes these things, you know, where people then go to the southern border and, and clean the shoes of, of people that cross that cross over the border in, in, in a kind of sign of, you know, but that's exactly what it is. It's, it's but the idea. Pope did that, re I mean, he's a Marxist, but the Pope did that recently, washing the feet of African migrants. Exactly, right? And this, this I think, this shows you that the connection is even stronger. And what I find always particularly interesting about this is because in, in many ways, when we talk about Western civilization, that kind of behavior would be completely alien to a Roman or an ancient Greek. Uh, and what I find even more interesting is there is only, and I say this with all, and to be very clear here, I must, here I must be very careful. Um, there's a difference between understanding and approving or understanding and endorsing. But even in many ways, the communist ideology is, I am exaggerating here, right? But I think it is fair to say that in many ways, it takes at least some cues from, from Christianity. Again, the idea of right, the uprising of the proletariat kind of against the oppressed class. Yeah. But there is, there is the, 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 the oppressed center, oppressed. Oh, again, also what's, what's the essence of wokeness? And that ultimately the oppressed is going to win. And just, just this one last point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only philosophy. And this, of course, makes it even, I guess, funny with the German accent. The only philosophy that really diverged from this, if you want, was kind of late 19th century German philosophy around Schopenhauer, about, uh, around, around Nietzsche. And then, of course, ultimately, I mean, even, I, um, you know, even national socialism and fascism is more different than I would think. But that, in a sense, right, was, was this idea that, wait a moment, why exactly... Um, should should it be the moral right thing to be to support the weak, right? To be on the side of the weak. Uh, why shouldn't we do something to support the strong, to make sure that they can flourish, right? The, the whole Übermensch and Supermensch idea, and this idea by Nietzsche that that Christianity is a slave religion. So, again, I prefer Christianity. And this is, as I said, this is understanding, not approving, but. This is very often why I don't like the contemporary debate, and that's why I think Carl made such a very, very but just an interesting, succinct, and important contribution. We need to get beyond the right calls everything they don't like Marxism, the left calls everything they don't like fascism, and that is supposed to be a debate. That is not a debate, right? That, that is not a philosophically <laughs> intriguing debate. This is just name calling. And there is, um, just as a last quick point on this, is I think that, that at least since 1945, as a random date, but I think it's not entirely wrong, 
philosophy has become a debate about different shades of liberalism. Yes. But it's not really a debate about potential alternatives. Now, let me also be very clear here. I mean, this is what Socrates was more or less saying. Right? Philosophy can be dangerous because I admit that we would be, like, if we would have a debate about hypothetically, wow, this is so different. But is it possible that the Nietzsche's of the world got something right? Is it, right? I mean, this, is a, this can be a very uncomfortable debate and potentially a dangerous debate because once you, you, you say, well, you know, you say maybe they had a point, uh, you potentially shoot out the legs under, under liberal democracy, which is, again, going back to Socrates, is what, he, is what he said, right? He said, I mean, if you look at the trial of Socrates, basically Socrates first defends his position, but later on he also defends the position of the Athenian government to sentence him to death because he's aware that philosophy can be really dangerous. And, and I think that's, at least in settings like this, we should have these conversations because otherwise, to be honest, it just gets boring. Yeah, but you, yeah. I think you're completely correct. And that's why Nietzsche is something that is, it's something people talk about now. Yeah. There's a reason that his critique actually had teeth. There's a reason that it scares people. His name is ominous when it comes up in a conversation because actually there was something true about what he was saying. And I mean, it can be uncomfortable in polite society to explore it, but you can't just sit there denying a true aspect of reality. This is the two sides of the post-liberal right, particularly in America, particularly in Washington, D.C., and that is the traditionalist, Latin mass going Catholic, vitalist revivalists, and the BAP acolytes, yeah. who are vitalist, but almost like neo-pagan, yeah. um, have very different ethnic and cultural particularities. And so that has been marginalized by the broad tent coalition, particularly the, the influential people like James Lindsay, for example, as, well, that's not liberalism, therefore we must brush that aside as being equivalent to yeah. fascism or Christian nationalism is uh, sort of dead end, even though I haven't read the book. But anyway, point being, so we, we, did, a, we did a little mini-series on, on James's stuff because I was frustrated by the fact that he went to war of Christian nationalism without defining what it is. Um, I, are you still blocked, Carl? Or, or have, Am I still? Uh, still yeah, blocked? no, I'm yeah. still blocked. Yeah, I mean, I don't consider it a great list, to be honest. No, it's a badge of honor, <laughs> frankly, at this well, point. It's not even a badge of honor. Like, I, I liked James Lindsay just fine. And then, I mean, as you can see by his reaction to me, it was just really childish and ill-informed. Yeah. Like, I, th I thought he would be able to explain to me what his position was, and he couldn't. And he gets personal really quickly. He got, yeah, no, and yeah. I was like, okay, well, if you think I'm your enemy, then that's your problem, because I've defended James Lindsay on many occasions. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, okay, why did I do that if uh, this is the kind of response I'm going to get, right? Because... Uh, because I wasn't just, you know, being bigoted about it or anything like that. You know, I've, I've long studied the liberal tradition. I've come out of it and been like, right, okay, actually, I think I've identified some concrete problems on this. Uh, and James Lindsay just acted like a child. So I was just like, okay, well, then I didn't lose anything. To put it in a, a perfect frame of reference, you were acting like the loyal opposition, and yeah. he saw you as an existential enemy. Yeah, and it, yeah. I think it betrays a fundamental insecurity about his own knowledge of his own tradition, yeah. whereas you are very learned and you can identify the vulnerabilities and thinking that you're going in the same trajectory. But and more, that, more of a just a quick thing, I'm an Englishman, therefore I'm naturally biased for the things liberalism wants, right? So I want to end up with those things because that's the English political tradition. I'm not abandoning that, but what I can't do is agree that we're going to continue with liberalism to get those things because we're not. We're going to go somewhere else, yeah. which is going to be atrocious. And so we need to challenge what liberalism's core assumptions are. Okay, they're actually quite easily challenged. We could change them. Yeah, and I think that's, again, that's just a good point because we've really narrowed in many ways the discourse, even those who, who want to, to broaden it. I mean, I'm sure you, we've, that's, I met you there, right, when the, the ARC conference took place in yes. London, right, the, was it the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship. And I think it was an interesting event, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's great if people engage and you have some big names who really try to make a difference. But even there, this, this new approach kind of to, 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 to find a utilitarian version of Christianity, yeah. right? This, this, I don't really believe in God or the gospel or Jesus, but it might be helpful. And this again brings me, that's even worse. Yeah. But if, if, if you're a convicted atheist and say, this is all nonsense, okay. But to say, I kind of still agree with the atheist, yeah. but for my own you know, psychological health, I pretend to believe. And this is, there is no, as Eric Hoffer would say, right, you, to revive your civilization, if we say that is the goal. And immediately admitting that the tool you want to use is something you don't really genuinely believe in. I'm sorry, that is not a great recipe. Yeah. I mean, this is, we tend to underestimate, you need, even in positive movements, you need a certain almost fanatic conviction. It's got to be sincerity. It's authenticity. Exactly. Yeah. It has to be. You can't, there's no substitute for it and no amount of pretending just because it's functionally. I could not agree more. Yeah. 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 Because it's, sorry, just, because it goes back to what you said before. It's, it's basically the same enlightenment thing. You say, we are so reasonable now 
that we understand the, whatever the, the positive effects of Christianity without actually believing in it. Yes. And that might be, you can do this maybe with a certain you know, layer of, of, of society if you want, but if you want to reinvigorate an entire society by saying, believe, pretend to believe in it even if you don't, I don't. If that's really going to work, you I have a soul. You need, you need a personal soul. soul. Because you know, I mean, one of the, one of the things that um, people who discuss ideology always forget is this is a naturally self-selecting thing for people who are quite intelligent. Uh, who have the capacity for extremely complex abstract reasoning? Well, the average person's got 100 IQ, actually, and they're not all PhD holding mathematicians it, like James Lindsay. Exactly, and if you want them all to come with you, you've got to stir the emotions. It's just you've got to make them truly believe, and it, and they, not even you have to make them; they have to truly, authentically believe. And it's just the way that the thing works. There's nothing you can do about it. You know? So push forward with the, with the framing on this, then. So just to set the stage, so this. Twitter debate was ignited because Oran McIntyre pointed out that DEI, as you said, isn't just a form of Marxism. Yes, there were the long marches through the institutions, as Chris Russo has well documented in his recent book. However, they were successful because liberalism was the fertile soil in which these uh, bad seeds could germinate and grow. Just, just a quick thing, though. <clears throat> no one ever asked, well, why do the communists always want to use liberalism to get to communism? And it's because the communists never challenge any of the original presuppositions of liberalism. They agree with the framing. Yeah, we want total liberty and total equality. Okay, great. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means all of civilization has to be gone. Hmm. That means no one can earn, own anything and no one can be dependent on another person. And the liberals begin at that point. Yes. They literally begin at that point. They harmonize the concepts of liberty and equality into being the abstract individual who owns nothing and lives in the state of nature. Yeah. And the communists agree and the reason they the, the reason they're angry and the reason if you read the communist manifesto it is vengeful the liberals have destroyed all of the sentimental bonds that held us together and then they own their property well why did we even come out of the state of nature in the first place well hobbes locke and rousseau all say well to protect our property so yeah because in the state of nature you don't have property and so com the communist manifesto is just them saying no 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 we're not stopping your bourgeois freedom and like, literally marx is just exactly this is what he says this is your bourgeois conception of freedom no, no, we're going back fully to the state of nature. You're not having any property. We're all going to be total equals. Everything is going to be as you promised in the beginning. That's why the liberals are still hanging around, and the communists are hanging around in the liberal camp. Well, this is why they the, always will. The communists yeah. are liberal accelerationists as well, and this is something we discussed in that premium podcast, and that yeah. is that because liberals value progress, they don't have an argument against adopting technologies that get more yield out of less energy. So they have some sort of directive momentum to their historical narrative. And so the communists are saying, well, yeah, great. So, so do we. You say that we had the anthropology of the state of nature. We want to return to the state of nature. We just think we can do it now. But the thing is, if the liberals say, well, we can um, adopt private property measures as some compromise between uh, freedom and equality to manage scarcity. Well, if the liberals keep generating abundance, they abolish scarcity. Exactly. If you get to a position of abundance, What's the point of property rights if you're no longer negotiating rationing? So the liberals will arrive at communism through technology, and they won't have an argument against it. And when they reach communism, they'll just go, well, our procedures are redundant. Now we're all communists. Yes. And that, that's why they're constantly saying, well, Star Trek's the, the, the communist future. No, it's the and, liberal utopia. And, 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 yeah, but yeah. That, that was always the argument. Well, no, it's very liberal. It's like, oh, actually, these things harmonize into the same thing in the very end point. Yep. That's the problem. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so that's why uh, James took umbrage with a very mature... But he's got no argument. He's got no argument on this, because I'm right. Quite, yeah. Uh, also, individual liberty versus collectivism by state edict. Yeah, but the state edict is socialism as a transitional mechanism yeah. towards communism. And, and every socialist said this. Yes, and, and even, and I've made a video on this in going into all the Marxist texts to say that because scarcity exists, the promise of communism is a pipe dream that people will use to sell to you so they can get dictatorship and power for themselves and remain at socialism. But if liberalism greases the wheels of the engine that will provide abundance, then you can actually get to stateless class as communism. Because yeah. the state and, and scarce rationing and the allocation of private property rights no longer matters. But for some reason, a man who's read a lot of communism doesn't understand that. Yeah, and, and I think there is, there is just as a quick air, because this Please. is such a wonderful point, and I think just an error, even the kind of individual liberty versus collectivism by state edict, history is more complex and complicated than this. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, and you mentioned, I think, Carl, I think you tweeted it today or, or, or maybe yesterday, we're going to say that, that a sense of belonging, this is what we talked before, but also kind of be part of a community, kind of finding moments in your life where you actually give up your individual liberty mm -hmm. is something that we do enjoy. Like that there's, there's, there's a sense in sacrifice has a positive element. The reason I know John Milton says, you know, what is better to, or as some character in John Milton's Paradise Lost says, it's better to to serve in, no, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Yeah, Satan. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I say main, communism is satanic, a main, a main character, as I said. Yeah. So, but but this is a this is really a crucial distinction, and and we did we tend to this bothers me so much because we tend to forget at least particularly in the 19th century, states, governments, institutions did attempt to forge collectivism in a sense, like nationalism. This this idea, and I think this was in the broader sense, a good thing. I think the idea to have national anthems, national authors, you know, a national language, these were good things. Did they kind of infringe? On, on, we can say it's kind of sad that there is now one Italian language and I don't think like these 74 different forms that they had in the 1860s. There is something lost there. I'm the first one to admit this. But do I think it's good that they unified into Italy? I think it was good. I think, you know, in the German case, we can have a debate whether that was good. <laughs> uh, So, oh, oh, do I think it was a good thing that, you know, that the Welsh, the Scottish, and the, the, the English and, and, and parts of, of, the, of the Irish, if you will, um, kind of have a unified United Kingdom kingdom that I still believe historically, whenever it counted, stood on the right side of history. I think that is a good thing. But this was also done through symbolism, through, you know, certain um, rituals and certain acts. But that's not a bad thing. So I, I don't like this, oh, it's either individual liberty or the state, you know, forces some community on you. Well, yes, but it, that's... But if it helps, I mean, Rousseau literally coined the phrase, we're going to force you to be free. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, yeah. The state will, the ultimate liberal state will literally make you maximally dependent on the state and minimally dependent on one another. So you will be forced to be that atomized individual who gets no one, no one's friendship or love or companionship or anything like that. So either way, like this isn't an, an either or discussion. Like both sides could be bad. You know, we've got to navigate. Exactly. And just this last yeah, one, please. because this is saying so crucially, so this is kind of what Patrick Deneen makes in, in his book about liberalism. It's exactly this. So so the, the idea then you, the, the, the once vision, I think that's probably the one where communist liberals went wrong, that at some point the state is going to fade away. It's the exact opposite. Because as you say, if you break down bonds of community, something is supposed to replace it. And this is the state. But the problem is, at least nowadays, or in the modern liberal vision, this is, for example, the unconditional basic income. Right? The state is not supposed to ask for anything in return. And there is, again, I think it's psychologically damaging to get a reward without any kind of obligation. I think this is a problem. You create a sense of entitlement Absolutely. that pervades so much of our society in a negative sense, which is why, again, I... We talked about all these problems with immigration, right? But if I, for example, go to the London Tube and I, I step over a 16-year-old, again, I hope I use this term correctly, you know, English trollop who's passed out to their own vomit, uh, that's, <laughs> also, correct, that's yeah. also not something that I would say, well, look at English civilization. Yeah. So this is... It's, oh, I bloody would. Christ. Right, exactly. <laughs> but also, she's the apex of freedom, isn't yeah. she? She's yeah. consuming what she likes. She's got no bonds of obligation to anyone else. Yeah. So... Yeah, the apex liberal woman is the drunk, passed out trollop. But you're you're completely right, and I, I I'm just saying this as a father. Uh, I would never give my children something without having them earned it. Right? Yes, they have to work for something if they want. The but here's the thing. But then at some point in the in, in the, the, the liberal utopia, the state is going to step in and say to your children, "You don't need your father." Yes, well, exactly. Because because that, because we got because that's ultimately ultimately liberty in that sense means a yes. complete. It's not just we said. The clan was, which I think was a good thing. Right? The clan was destroyed, but now it's kind of also moved to the kind of the small family formation, yeah. where, where parents are. And you, and, and the, the funny part about this is, um, if we would have said this a couple of years ago, they would have said, "Oh my God, it, it, the whining, it, the, the alarmism." But yeah. this is exactly when you have lost, let's say, for example, that the school or a doctor has to support the transitioning of a child, right? Even if she's 12 or younger, without informing the parents. This is exactly what we are talking about. This is yeah. precisely this. So a state bureaucrat who doesn't know the individual, has more of a say potentially in the young person's decision than the people who have known her or him or whatever than it is their entire life. And we would assume, I think in 90% of the cases, most parents love their children. Yes. So even the automatic assumption is that parents want something bad for their children, but the state is the institution that wants the really true good. And that's it's monstrous. And the, the, the idea that a state bureaucrat doesn't see you as anything other than a number on a spreadsheet it's just baffling to me. I agree. Yeah. It's it's just you, no, come on. These don't they don't know you, they don't care about you. In fact, every number that crosses through their spreadsheet is a, an inconvenience to them. Like they they don't they don't get paid by the number. They don't get paid to be invested. They get paid regardless. Yeah. So every number that comes through, the bureaucrats are like, right, get it off, get off, right, I can go home early. You know? So just saying well, the incentives. Opinions like this is what got you blocked. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe, <laughs> but which was a, right. a really mature re rejoinder, you know, <laughs> pr protecting children from the interventionist liberal state is apparently a blockable offence. And then someone did weigh in. I'll just I'll just finish on this because I made my point at the start: the assertion that liberals haven't read Locke. Uh, 
Helen Pluckrose, who was James's yeah. co-author yeah. on uh, cynical theories. James also co-authored a book with Peter Bogosian, who's coming in soon. Uh, um, titled, Peter's great. Peter's yeah. not got yeah. this attitude yeah. at all. Well, I assume Peter was who titled the book How to Have Difficult Conversations and not James. <laughs> uh, but, but, but Helen Pluckrose wades in yeah. and uh, has, a, has a large breakdown. Oh, maybe... Right, well, I don't she, know what's happening there. But, yeah, good thing I screenshot that, really. Yeah, so here's here's a screenshot. She she examines just to, your, just to explain this. Right? Yeah. So um, I was due to have just a friendly conversation with Helen, uh, who's an academic, about um, well, my articles on liberalism, and uh, the this was her notes that she had made, and she because she had to go to New Zealand for a family issue, so it didn't happen, and this had all kicked off, and so I I, I screenshotted this because she's literally making the argument I'm making in those articles. Because when I, the first point being pre social man and state of nature, and she says, I don't know what it means. I'm not familiar with those philosophers. Uh, so the foundational liberal Grotius, philosophers. Grotius, Hobbes, Rousseau, Locke, and a couple of others. Um, and she says, I'm not familiar. With so, okay, well, we can't have a conversation about the philosophy of liberalism if, you've, if you're not familiar with those philosophers. Well, it's just, you literally hasn't read Locke. In her bio, <laughs> in her bio, it is liberal principles and evidence based ideas. And it's like, I, I further in, interrogated her argument before she blocked me. Um, <laughs> you, got also, blocked, you got blocked there as well. Yeah, I wasn't rude at all. I just wanted to. No, be you clear. weren't. You weren't. I was very polite, like when I was dealing with Pete Hitchens. Um, and I, I, I just got her to explain the position. Her view that her, her view is that liberalism begins with Mill. Um, there's a there's a strong argument to make Mill isn't really a liberal. Um, so he comes out of the liberal tradition, but the, it, I don't want to get into the weeds of it. But like. He doesn't okay. really believe in natural rights. He's utilitarian. Yeah, and he doesn't believe in the state of nature. Uh, so uh, you can definitely argue that utilitarianism is a successor ideology, but not the same as liberalism. Obviously. And um, Helen begins at the point of, I I'm a utilitarian. Mill was right. And it's like, Mill wasn't right about anything, actually. Yep. I'm probably going to write a treatise one day on how utilitarianism is nonsense. You can't collectivize and redistribute happiness. That exists exclusively on our heads. It's all wrong. It's all... Anyway... And so, so just to, just to, <laughs> I'm not going to get into it. Just, just to finish so off wrong. with this as well. Um, if you, <laughs> even if you haven't read about the state of nature, I think it's fair to say that liberals act as if it exists because yeah. something that Helen did include in her notes was references to Stephen Pinker, and this is something we've said in our long form podcast coming out soon. Stephen Pinker writes the blank slate, talking about how the state of nature <laughs> is a fallacy. References Locke goes through all all of the literature available to him at the time on evolutionary psychology and neuroimaging to say there are differences between peoples, between men and women, are unconscious. And then writes Enlightenment Now, saying that the redistribution of material resources will make everyone equal and equally enlightened. And the better angels of our nature saying that society is on the long arc towards to, of history bending towards justice, observable by the fact that states are decreasing their amount of crime. Now, Stephen, fascist states also have a lot low crime. So that might not want to be the standard that you implement there because it kind of underwrites your liberal ideal. And also, we had a low crime rate before we had a massive state. And then the 20th century happened. Hmm, quite. So if you're a liberal, um, maybe read some Locke. <laughs> if you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that is on the site, such as the Epoch series, this episode on King John. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.